Well, hello, my name's Simon Moore, and I want to wel welcome you today to our live webcast on making the business case for safe patient handling, brought to you in partnership by the Risk Authority of the Stanford University Medical Network and the Association for Safe Patient Handling Professionals. Now, today we're looking at safe patient handling, and the context is that most healthcare leaders and um, mid-level uh, managers in healthcare today don't realise that uh, the injuries associated with manual handling procedures represent the most costly occupational health problem in the United States today. Now, safe patient handling programs hold great promise to address the injuries that um, occur to patients and caregivers. But determining the scope of the program, uh, getting the right level of financial investment from the stakeholders, um, ensuring a successful implementation and ongoing uh, successful rollout of that program, and then finally demonstrating the return on investment over time represents significant challenges to the mid-level managers often who are responsible for those programs. So it's to those questions we're going to be talking about today. Now joining me in the studio are four leading experts in the area. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to get each of them to introduce themselves to you individually. So why don't we start off with uh, you, Ed. Thanks, Simon. My name is Ed Hall. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Risk Authority. Uh, my role and responsibility within the organization is I oversee the claims and litigation for the workers' comp and medical malpractice programs. Um, I'm also responsible for the prevention programs associated with risk reduction for uh, Stanford Hospital and Clinics and Lucille Packard Children's Hospital. Um, as it relates to this particular issue, uh, safe patient handling, uh, I have about 15 years in trying to protect, perfect the business case and uh, moving these programs forward and making sure that, the, that there's not a financial reason that we don't uh, invest in this type of program. Awesome. And you, Susan? Thank you, Simon. I'm Susan Gallagher, and I am an independent consultant that uh, really looks at safety, quality, and liability risk. I'm really interested in the intersections between bariatrics, safe patient handling, um, skin and wound care risk, and some of the non-reimbursable events that we see now in healthcare. Terrific. And John? Thank you, Simon. I'm John Salona. I'm an engineer, attorney, and professional decision analyst. After having practiced decision analysis for 31 years now, I can actually say I've done A to Z, automobiles to zinc mines. The textbook on decision analysis that Peter McNamee and I wrote was first published in 1986 and is now in its fourth edition. I lecture on decision analysis at the undergraduate, graduate, and executive education levels in the School of Engineering at Stanford University. I'm on faculty at the Stanford Center for Professional Development, the Academy of the American Society for Healthcare Risk Management and the American course on drug development and regulatory sciences. I'm also on the International Panel for Patient Handling and Ergonomics. Great to be here today. <coughs> Thanks, Sean. And finally, Eric. Thank you. My name is Eric Race. I'm the president and founder of Atlas Lift Tech. I was uh, originally um, encountering safe patient handling out in the field as I was a professional firefighter for six years. Um, I was also responsible for implementing a safe patient handling program at a level one trauma center. As I was implementing the program, I recognized the unique challenges associated with these programs and how um, each one of these individuals that were handling patients were actually taking uh, their safety and throwing it out the window. They were caring more about the patient than they were themselves. With that said, I actually went out, cashed out my retirement and my deferred comp and started a company dedicated to implementing sustainable and successful safe patient handling programs. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, guys. It's terrific to have you all uh, with us today. So uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we brought all of our experts ha um, into the studio and asked them some pointed questions around uh, the areas that uh, I mentioned previously. Um, what we did was we edited those videos down into four short segments, which we're going to show today. And then we're going to bring it back to the panel after each segment for some panel discussion. We're going to hear from Eric and Susan talk about the importance of safe patient handling to caregivers, patients, and healthcare organizations. We're going to hear principally from uh, Eric and Ed um, on the implementation and rollout of the safe patient handling program at Stanford University Medical Center and the lessons learned there. We're going to hear from Ed and John about how the safe patient handling business case was put together for the $5 million program at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. And finally, John's going to talk to us about how to demonstrate the value of the programs over time. 
Now, as you come up with questions um, from things that the speakers say, or perhaps you're experiencing certain challenges or have certain questions about safe patient handling at your facility, um, please ask us those questions um, using the comment box that's on your screen. We're going to be collecting those questions and addressing them during our live Q&A at the end. And of course, if you have any issues uh, with the technology, send us an email at connect at theriskauthority.com. Also, we're going to be taking three live polls uh, during the web webinar today, and that'll show up on your screen as a widget. So without further ado, let's go into our first polling question, um, which is, what role do you have within your org organization? Let us know who we've got uh, joining us today. Are you a safe patient handling coordinator, a healthcare risk manager? Are you a nurse or a care staff member? Are you a healthcare administrator, a worker safety professional, or an insurance provider? All right, so you guys can, uh, if you're in a group also, please let us know uh, if you are in a group uh, by sending us a comment saying, hey, you know, we've got 20 people here, so we, uh, so we capture that as well. Um, but before we go into the next video, uh, you can fill out that poll and I'll give you the answers at the end um, of who we've got joining us today. So without further ado, into our first video. Um, Eric and Susan explaining the significance of safe patient handling to caregivers, to patients, and to healthcare organizations. I believe safe patient handling is best described as policies, procedures, and support, which enable healthcare workers to mobilize patients in a way that prevents caregiver injury and promotes patient safety. Safe patient handling is a very complex program. It's something that addresses and touches every patient from admission through to discharge. It affects all of the nursing staff and care staff. And to treat it as anything other than that is to make a big mistake. This is something that is very significant, both from a financial perspective and also from an outcomes perspective. I started my career as a wound care nurse. And what I found was many of the patients who came to me were of size, larger, heavier, obese patients. I became certified in uh, bariatric nursing shortly thereafter. And then what I learned was that many of the reasons why there were skin injury around larger, heavier patients is because caregivers were afraid to lift, turn, reposition patients. And it seemed to me that safe patient handling would be a way to navigate around some of the issues that we saw um, managing those non-reimbursable events among the obese patient. What I've learned since then is it's not just the obese patient that poses issues around safety, it's all patients. Anytime we're expected uh, to lift, turn, reposition patients, I often think about the triad of danger. If the patient's immobile and we're afraid of lifting, turning, repositioning because we're afraid of injuring ourselves, then the patient develops those immobility-related consequences of care. Behind every injury, there's a productivity increase crying to get out. And so it really comes down to the idea that individuals want to get the job done. And especially individuals in the healthcare arena, think about the patient first. They, they don't necessarily protect themselves. In many cases, they put their patient in front of themselves. And so what we see is a crippling epidemic of the uh, nursing staff becoming the patients themselves. Leading experts in the safe patient handling movement, Martin Cohen and Mary Matz, both explain that the pushing and pulling action regularly performed during the repositioning of patients is the most commonly cited single cause of occupational injuries in the healthcare sector today. Historically, manual handling was the standard of practice. To put this in context, the leg of a 250 pound person generally weighs about 39 pounds. Clearly, most lifting tasks in healthcare involve much more than 35 pounds of body weight. In years past, we didn't have the science to understand the threat of manual lifting. We now know that 75% of the time we lift, push, pull more than 35 pounds, microfractures occur to the vertebral end plates. These go on to heal but create scar tissue which accumulates over time and eventually threatens the function of the end plate. This does not mean that 75% of manual lifts produce acute injuries, rather they produce these cumulative injuries for reasons just described. So when acute injuries result as expressions of cumulative damage, recovery is especially slow and unpredictable. Let me share some data from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, which illustrates obesity trends in America from 1985 to 2012. As I do, let me describe a study conducted by Tui Main, which suggested that the average nurse 
during an average eight hour shift lifted, pushed, pulled an average of 1.8 tons. That study was conducted in 1997. Let's stop and look at the 1997 CDC data. As we move through the data, notice the increasing prevalence of obesity. Further today, many caregivers work 12 hour shifts. This raises the question of what weight caregivers lift in today's healthcare environment on a daily basis. Consider a few of the typical risk scenarios, such as transferring an obese patient between a chair and a bed, or transferring a patient between a chair and a shower or bathtub, or laterally transferring a patient between a bed and a stretcher. Manual handling in any of these circumstances is unsafe, but especially with the patient of size. As part of the Deficit Reduction Act of 2005, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, recognized what are referred to as hospital-acquired conditions and have placed provisions in the inpatient prospective payment system for non-payment if certain circumstances exist. Healthcare planners are scrambling to find solutions to the non-reimbursable events as described by CMS. The underlying contributing factor in at least four arguably seven of these events, is immobility. So if we can manage immobility, we may be able to mitigate some of the economic consequences of these events. The first immobility-related consequence of care, which comes to mind, is the pressure ulcer problem. Pressure ulcers are costly economically, both from a reimbursement and a liability claim perspective. Other immobility-related patient safety issues are DBT, readmissions within 30 days, hospital-acquired pneumonia, arguably catheter-associated urinary tract infection, arguably surgical site infection, and definitely fall-related injuries. In fact, in a 2012 Joint Commission publication, it was reported that the issue of falls is particularly important to healthcare today. In an analysis of over 7,000 inpatient falls, researchers found that more than 25% resulted in some degree of injury. A number of authors indicate that the safest approach is the approach that is truly caring. A safety-based program, which is comprised of trained healthcare workers who use appropriate mechanical lifts and repositioning devices rather than manual handling. One study documented a 49% reduction in patient falls related to lift and transfer activities using the processes I just described. These practices also free healthcare workers from the burden of lifting patients so they can devote their energy and mindfulness to more meaningful patient care. The goal is to let healthcare workers provide healthcare and let proper safe mechanical devices provide lifting. This really is a good first step to protect both patients and healthcare workers from injury. As the New Jersey legislature noted in a statement of findings, and I quote, studies show that manual patient handling and movement negatively affect patient safety, quality of care, and patient comfort, dignity, and satisfaction. And it is appropriate public policy to minimize unassisted patient handling. It is important for healthcare facilities to understand that across the nation, there is a legislative movement mandating safe patient handling measures. 10 of the 50 U.S. states already have legislative mandates or resolutions which address safe patient handling. For example, the state of California passed Assembly Bill 1136 in October 2011, which mandated specific requirements towards safety in the general and acute care settings. On June 26, 2013, the American Nurses Association introduced the Safe Patient Handling and Mobility Interprofessional Statement. This is a wonderful and comprehensive document which describes the what and why of safe patient handling and mobility. And it's the first time a national professional organization has initiated such widespread support for safe patient handling. Two months later, the corresponding implementation guide was released. The implementation guide provides a step-by-step how-to guide for implementing a safe patient handling and mobility culture. Well, thanks, guys, and I think that was a really good overview um, of safe patient handling, what it is, and how important it is, and also the importance for safe patient handling programs and their promise to address some of the issues. Um, Susan, you, you spoke about a legislative move, move at the moment, um, going state by state with um, states mandating facilities implement um, safe patient handling measures. Is that something that um, you foresee continuing on an ongoing basis, or um, maybe you could give us some commentary around that? 
Right. So there are a number of different states that either have mandates or resolutions around safe patient handling and mobility. What we do know is that there is national legislation now that has been crafted mm -hmm. um, and is being examined and it's based on the ANA standards. So I do think the standards were the first step crafting the national uh, legislative um, processes is probably the next. And so I do think this movement's going to continue. Okay, great. And, and do you see, like, um, like what's been the major um, motivator for facilities to implement these programs? Is it these mandates or is it other things? So I think that the primary driver uh, were workman's comp data. I really do think that that was probably the first thing that we mm -hmm. looked at. But I think that what we're seeing now is we're trying to tie uh, safe patient handling and mobility then to the immobility related consequences of care. And mm -hmm. those are the non-reimbursable events. So initially we looked at the worker's comp piece and the mandates and now we're looking at from an economic perspective does safe patient handling and mobility really make a difference around that. Right, so not just looking at it from a um, risk management on the workers' comp, but looking at it as part of a um, part of the whole care package for patients exactly. and improving healthcare outcomes. Mm -hmm. Okay, exactly. cool. Um, and Eric, like when you know in, in your work, um, you've seen facilities get started. Sort of, you know, how do they generally get off the ground, and what sort of programs types are, are available for, for for people? So typically, an organization uh, that's just getting started, they might go out and just purchase equipment and implement a policy. Um, someone might call that a safe patient handling program. And what we're seeing now is that just purchasing equipment and implementing a policy doesn't actually equate to a program. Okay. There needs to be true uh, systematic uh, approach to implementing the program. And so administrative buy-in, managerial support, and ultimately a culture of safety that needs to be embraced is what is needed to have a successful and sustain sustainable safe patient handling program. So uh, what we're seeing is that the formation of an interdisciplinary committee is really key, and that's uh, gathering up a group of individuals within the organization that recognize the benefits from a workers' comp perspective, a patient outcome perspective, the administrative side, and really it's the holistic approach to safe patient mm -hmm. handling. No longer is it just equipment uh, and all of a sudden your injuries go away. It truly is a uh, programmatic solution. Right. Um, those forms of, of programs that you asked about, uh, historically we've seen facilities approaching it with uh, two types of programs, a minimal lift program or a lift team program. And a minimal lift program is a program where the nurses are trained away from the bedside in a classroom setting. The classroom setting uh, training typically are about two to four hours. And they'll go through all of the equipment uh, within the facility and trained on scenario-based learning. Um, while very effective, uh, it is very costly to pull those nurses away from the bedside. Uh, with lift teams, uh, the historical norm has been um, two big strong individuals uh, that are given to the nurses as a resource, uh, however they quickly uh, become dependent on those resources. Additionally, we're putting uh, those lift team members uh, at basically a high risk job because they're not given the uh, tools for the task. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as Dr. Gallagher explained, we can see that the vertebral end plate fractures happen over a course of uh, their career and basically we're just accelerating that injury and um, we see the injuries being shifted from the nursing staff to the lift team. So there's a new emerging model with um, those two types of programs which is a lift coach model where it's a hybrid of um, the lift team and the uh, minimal lift program where an individual is doing training at the bedside, uh, implementing the program as well as working with the care staff to provide that just-in-time training. And is that um, is that the kind of approach that Stanford took at in their program? It, absolutely. They, uh, they have evolved into this model and they started um, with a variety of different approaches and that's how many uh, organizations get started is it's um, there's not a one-size-fits-all to safe patient handling. There's no right or wrong. Lift teams have worked extremely successful in many of the UC system hospitals, and the VA has proven that minimal lift is a, uh, a very robust model as well. So it's not that lift coach or lift team or minimal lift is right. It's whatever's right for that organization. Okay, great. Well, that feeds nicely into our next section, um, talking about um, how safe patient handling was rolled out at Stanford University Medical Center. But before we get into that, um, let's do our second polling question. Um, I'll get the results on the first one soon. Uh, but the second one is, what is the biggest challenge for implementing a safe patient handling program at your facility? And we've got four possible answers here. Funding for equipment, um, coordination between departments, 
uh, compliance tracking or ongoing training costs. So uh, fill those out and we'll be collecting those results. So without further ado, uh, let's get into our next video featuring Ed and Eric talking about the implementation and rollout of the program at Stanford. Um, Bill Charney implemented uh, the first Lyft team program, or the first successfully implemented documented Lyft team in, in 1990. And um, that was right around the time of his book as well, the Back Injury Among Healthcare Workers book. And uh, what they found is that uh, basically putting the risk into a controllable group was the best way. There was also another approach, and um, that was really pushed by Audrey Nelson and the Safe Patient Handling Movement. Um, really stemmed from that. It was um, the minimal lift program. And the minimal lift program was um, the idea of training all individuals within the uh, hospital to properly utilize the equipment. And then there would be uh, various levels of, of staff training. And uh, it certainly is a great approach as well. With a lift team approach, you have uh, high user compliance. Um, uh, you have uh, individual trained employees where the risk is controllable. With the minimal lift program, you have um, everybody in, in charge of being safe. Uh, you don't have that sense of dependency. However, um, each of them has their own problems or their own inherent problems, and we still see them today. With the lift teams, it's very common for facilities to uh, experience nursing dependency, uh, where the nurses are dependent on the lift team in order to stay safe. Uh, additionally, as the program gains success and, and grows and evolves, the, um, the demand for the utilization of that lift team will increase, and um, inherently the, the problem is uh, basically staffing that, that FTEs are hard to come by within facilities. Um, so, so there's a, an issue with the lift teams and, and with the minimal lift programs when we begin looking at the indirect cost of training and what it costs a facility to pull uh, nursing care staff away from the bedside, it's uh, remarkably expensive. The VA uh, rates it at $121 for a nurse away from the bedside and that's uh, to backfill that nurse in order to um, adhere to patient care staff ratio, ratios while having that uh, nurse attend a training class. So if we were to look at a facility, say of Stanford size, it can be um, 800,000 plus dollars or nearing almost a million dollars once you put in education fees and the logistics. Um, additionally, it's, it's a lower user compliance model. Um, if nurses are given the opportunity to walk 30 feet uh, go and grab the appropriate lift, apply the sling, move the patient, uh, versus just doing it quickly or uh, what they perceive as quickly with their uh, nursing assistant or, or partner, it's, it's common that they will uh, utilize the 30 years of practice and that's just boosting patients in bed, manual handling of patients. Um, to that end, there was an opportunity and that opportunity was to take basically the successes uh, shared among the two types of programs and, and also learn from the failures and create a hybrid model. And Stanford really set out uh, in 2008 by implementing uh, this program structure. They um, discussed it and socialized the idea of a um, safe patient handling embedded expert or the lift coach model. Um, the, the lift coach model is really emerging as the industry best practice. Um, it combines the successes of, of both the lift team and the minimal lift program and learns from the failures. And um, what I mean by that is it takes the high user compliance of a lift team and um, integrates a individual that's responsible for the proper utilization of equipment. Um, and also eliminates the indirect cost of training by performing uh, the training at the bedside. Uh, additionally, it, it creates a, a minimal lift program structure where there's unit-based peer leaders, there's facility champions, and so in essence you have a safe patient handling minimal lift program on steroids or a one-man lift team. Whatever way you want to look at it, it is basically the best of both worlds. And uh, with today's hybrid cars, it's just like that, it's a hybrid program. Uh, we're putting together uh, two pieces in order to create uh, a sustainable culture change. 
Awesome. So, I mean, that was really, really informative, Eric. Thanks very much. Um, Ed, maybe you could talk a little bit about how the, um, the program evolved um, at Stanford to the model that it is working today um, and, you know, lessons learned along the way. Yeah, sure, great. So, um, you know, at Stanford, uh, when I first got there, we had pilot areas that were up and running, and that's typically how most organizations start off their programs. They'll pilot in a few units, um, they'll get the program started, they'll see how it goes, they'll see if there's injury reductions mm -hmm. in those particular areas, um, and then they'll start to use the spread methodology and spread it out throughout the organization. Um, that type of process happened uh, at Stanford as well. Um, when I first got there, we did have the pilots uh, un underway. And so what we did was we um, instituted, um, uh, where we actually started the decision dialogue process um, with the team and actually uh, got a project team together. It's our interdisciplinary group that Eric referred to in his video um, because the, the programs are so complex. You have uh, housekeeping that has to be a part of this. You have laundry, you'll have um, infection control, you'll have the nursing staff, you'll have administration, workers comp, all of these groups that ha have to be a part of this program to make the program work. Um, and then we also got the decision makers involved as a part of the program as well. We had to define the problem, state it to them, let them know what it was, and then kind of move through our process of uh, presenting alternatives and information about the program, where we wanted to migrate from this pilot into a full-blown housewide program. And then we did analysis recommendations and then gained our funding, funding for the program. As we uh, move forward through the process, uh, we definitely had um, some bumps along the road. Um, compliance associated with the program can sometimes be tough, especially on an initial rollout, because we are creating a cultural change within the organization, which is tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so many failure points in these particular programs. Um, if for some, for some reason uh, the laundry situation or we're out of slings um, and, and we don't have sling, slings available on the unit, you, can, you cannot expect that you're going to end up getting compliance associated with the program. So, you know, as you work through all of those problems and those issues within the organization, you start to uh, fine-tune it, um, and you also have to have continue, continuation of funding for these types of programs as well because um, they're not cheap, although there's a great return on investment as we're starting to see with these programs and um, going through it. Uh, you know, you, you really have to show and demonstrate that to your senior leadership as you move, through, move forward through the program. Awesome. Awesome. All right, well that uh, segues nicely into the next section, which is all about how that program um, kind of rolled through Stanford with some of those challenges that um, they faced and the lessons learned. Um, I've got some polling results here. Um, it looks like the majority of our uh, attendees today are safe patient handling coordinators, um, followed by a tie uh, between nurse and care staff members and worker safety professionals. So we've certainly got the right people on the webcast today. Um, so let's go into our next video, um, talking about how the program was rolled up at Stanford uh, and some of the lessons learned along the way. So one of my primary responsibilities was the implementation and the rollout of the Safe Patient Handling Program at Stanford Hospital and Clinics. We've been working on the program since 2007 and have seen a major movement in the program since its inception. If you're a mid-level manager that has been tasked with implementing uh, a new safe patient handling program or taking the safe patient handling program to the next level, um, the first thing to recognize is this is bigger than just you. Uh, you can't fight this fight by yourself. Um, you, you need to incorporate the um, other individuals that uh, the safe patient handling program touches and affects. So one of the things that we did was we partnered with key strategic partners within the organization. Nursing was a significant component to move the program forward, and so we gave them the lead, provided them the education. Um, we took them to uh, conferences on the East Coast to escalate their understanding of the problem, the issue, and the solutions associated with those problems. And then we helped them understand how the financial return was developed and showed the benefits associated with nursing staff as well as other caregivers. So from there, we developed an interdisciplinary committee that would participate in the program. You have people like infection control that need to participate. You also have workers' compensation, risk management, nursing, transport, housekeeping, all have to be a part of the program, which are going to be a part of the solution to move this program forward. Forming uh, the interdisciplinary committee is key. Bringing together um, kind of a think tank approach to the implementation and strategy uh, is truly the first step. 
I think with any program that you need to have oversight um, and we have a very good program here with the interdisciplinary um, group that we have for the steering committee. Um, they make sure that the policies and procedures are in place. Um, they make sure that the daily operations go smoothly so that we can have a successful program. Nursing engagement is difficult. Uh, this is their environment. You are basically uh, asking for permission to change their workflow. And so uh, there's a fair amount of pre-planning that goes into that. That's the marketing of the program, um, understanding the culture of the hospital. Each hospital is different. If you try and introduce um, a various pieces of equipment at one facility, it may not work at another. Um, it also depends on the evolution of the program, whether the program's brand new or on its fifth year, there's different ways that it has to be navigated. Uh, if the nursing staff have not yet seen any patient lift equipment, it's difficult to tell them, here's the lift, use it every time, and never think of doing it with your partner again. Uh, additionally, listening to the nursing staff and being their friend is key. The, the safe patient handling programs should not be viewed as punitive for them. In many cases, administration wants to tell them, you need to do this or else. And at the end of the day, the nursing staff will just say, I'll just get it done with my partner. Um, what, what we want to do is understand why they don't use the equipment. So listening to them and understanding the reasons why they don't use the equipment is because they feel that it's faster to get it done with um, the teamwork or the team lift approach. Additionally, we see that the nursing staff might say, well, I have to turn my patient two or three times just to get the sling underneath them, so I might as well just manually lift them. There's uh, education that needs to happen, a knowledge transfer that has to happen in order for the nursing staff to understand why they need to utilize the equipment and the successful outcomes that will be achieved. Uh, you, you can't just buy equipment. People need to know how to use it. They need to know how to use it safely and properly. And they need to know the policies and procedures in place to make sure that they are utilizing it. Um, it's dignity for the patient. You know, no patient wants you to show up with a piece of equipment and not know how to use it. Right, it's one thing to buy the equipment for the organization and to provide the initial training, but where I have actually seen the most impact is the ongoing follow-up by the manager and uh, the buy-in at the frontline manager level as well as the staff because if it's not considered an expectation, staff won't necessarily use it despite it being there and being available. So that's been the biggest change and the biggest eye-opener I think for us at the leadership committee level and trying to change that culture. Cultural change is something that can't just be achieved by turning on a switch. You can't buy culture, you can't do anything except for create culture. Um, so it's a very strong uh, committee support, uh, a very strong program marketing support, uh, making sure that the nurse's voice is heard as well as administration's voice is heard. Um, Having the nurse understand or the care staff understand that while this is a compliance program, it's actually a gift to you and your patients. And so at that program um, or that facility, it was launched on Nurses Week and it was positioned as a gift to the nursing staff and it was very well received that way. So uh, on the same day that the program went live, they were actually handing out um, ice cream sundaes. So it's um, one and the same in the sense that one is a gift uh, for, for the nurse on a, on a job satisfaction standpoint, the other one is just tastes good. So some of the benefits associated with the program were about a $2.5 million reduction in employee injuries. Uh, we saw a reduction in lost and restricted days. We also started to see some ancillary benefits such as patient referrals. Patient felt more dignified when they were transferred with the equipment and so they would come back, for example, for their MRI. We also saw em employee satisfaction increased. Um, we saw an increase of about 7% in those areas where safe patient handling equipment was employed. I think that knowing that my nurses can come to work every day and not risk injuring themselves, that they feel that they don't go home at the end of the day tired and in pain, and then not looking forward to coming to work the next day, or I run the risk of having them off work for weeks on end and potentially losing them as a nurse. It could end their career if they hurt themselves. I think it's worth having the lift equipment around. Yeah. I think the key to our success is we developed a committee that was focused on it for all four years 
It was an interdisciplinary committee and they met every month and they went over the results associated with the program and they stayed consistent with the process. The tipping point for the program is typically when the nurses say, I stopped going home with a sore back. I can live my life the way that I want to. Um, nurses didn't go to nursing school in order to manually handle patients. That's just a, a component of their job, or they've been told that that's a component of their job. They went to school to be nurses. You know, I've had nurses tell me that the reason why they came to Stanford is because we, we have safe patient handling equipment here and that they feel that they can safely give care to their patients and not have the risk of injuring themselves in that care. So we saw benefits that were good for the patients, that were good for the caregivers, that were consistent with rehabilitation efforts, and also a significant financial impact to the organization. Awesome, thanks guys. So uh, the results on our last poll uh, to the question, what is the biggest challenge in implementing a program, uh, came in with 40% each actually. 40% uh, said compliance tracking was the major issue uh, and 40% uh, said the ongoing training costs. So we spoke a little bit about some of the ongoing training costs. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about some of that compliance. Um, so Ed, you know, how do the how do you sustain these programs? Like, uh, how how did you guys sustain it um, at Stanford? Well, you know, it comes back to the investment within the organization. Um, I think in order to, uh, and of course we had our bumps in the road associated with the program, but um, the con continued visibility um, between uh, your decision makers and your project team is imperative. Um, and also the continuation of funding to keep the program moving forward and making sure that you have the right resources in place um, to be able to uh, achieve compliance associated with the mm -hmm. programs. One thing that we um, definitely saw a need for. Uh, I can say that um, you would think that the first time that you do the financial business case and you purchase the equipment and you get the initial push that first year, uh, you may be done with the, uh, the business case. Uh, but in fact, at Stanford, we're actually on our, um, on our fifth rendition of the business case and also showing some of the results associated with the program to continue to do cost justification for the program to keep our compliance levels up and show the return on investment associated with the program. So, so I can see how, like, that works for you know your senior stakeholders you know who are paying the bills mm -hmm. but what about for the frontline um, you know folks who are actually you know tasked with either making sure that other nurses are using the equipment or or otherwise like how do you keep them enthused about using the uh, using the equipment well I, you know I think probably the most important thing is to to let them see the benefits associated with the entire program. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a benefit to them personally um, and it's a benefit to their family taking it on a personal note. Um, it's also a benefit to the patient and helping them to understand how does this act, how does this program actually benefit the patient. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly look at it from a financial perspective from an administration point of view um, but from a personal point of view and how it can actually impact the organization, impact the reputation of the organization, um, improve patient satisfaction, improve employee satisfaction. All of those components need to be highlighted and actually disseminated to staff so that they can understand the value associated with this program and its benefits. And, and so are you sort of going around and doing sort of educational sessions to departments? Are you sending it via email? Like concretely how are you getting that communication sort of out? So we utilize specifically our uh, working group um, mm -hmm. that you've seen in the video. Right. Um, it is uh, kind of their charter to take that information back to the group and disseminate the information and to continue to sustain the culture within the organization. Right, cool. And Susan, from a, a layperson's perspective over here, you know, going from, um, you know, hands-on sort of, um, you know, you're, you've got this relationship between your caregivers and your patients, mm -hmm. and then putting some some mechanical devices in the middle. Like how do patients respond to the use of lifts and, um, and those slings and, and harnesses and things like that? Mm -hmm. Simon, I really think that that's a two-part question. And I think the, probably the most important thing is for uh, caregivers to be confident in use of the equipment. I myself, as a caregiver, have had experiences when I don't feel confident in, in equipment, and then it's just not used. Mm. Doesn't that make sense? Uh, and then as far as, and you know, Eric can speak to that uh, as well. And as far as the patients, the patients love the equipment. If the caregiver uh, brings the equipment in with confidence. Mm. So I think that's part of it and I think as Ed had mentioned even in the whole rehab process the patients feel really good about being able to make progress because they know they can safely then um, 
become more mobile. Awesome, yeah. awesome, very cool. Well, look, um, for, for those who are joining us live, um, I understand that we're running a little bit over time, such as the nature of show business. Hmm. Um, but we do want to get through the last bit. So um, I want to let you know that we are recording today's uh, webcast. We're going to release it um, as a, a whole live file that you can watch. Um, also on the landing page, you'll have access to the videos, that the pre-recorded videos that we showed today. Um, but let's go into our final sort of big section here, looking at how you actually make that financial business case using the tools of decision analysis. And just to get our juices flowing, let's do our last polling question, which is what is or what was the most significant driver for implementing a safe patient handling program at your facility? We've got a number of options here. Is it the workers' comp claims like we spoke about before? Is it the lost and restricted work days? Are patient injuries the major driver, employee turnover, patient satisfaction, patient safety initiatives, or compliance with legislative mandates? So let us have your responses and we'll discuss those at the end. But right now, let's get into talking to Ed and John about making that financial business case for safe patient handling. Now, the first thing you may be wondering is, why do I need a business case for safe patient handling? And a possible answer is, you may not. It could be that your organization has already decided to go ahead with it, or there's a regulatory mandate, or you've gotten data from one of the vendors which tells you a little bit about what you can expect from program benefits, and that's enough to move forward on. But you might need more than that. You might have a struggle in your organization to compete for funding with other competing funding priorities. You might not be sure about what the scope of your effort should be and how many of the therapeutic areas you should put equipment into, uh, whether you should do the portable equipment or invest more in the overhead lifts, or you may be wondering how do we identify what the value drivers are to really get the most value out of our program and lastly, when it's all done, how do we measure to verify and validate that we're actually getting the value out of our program and we're getting the return on investment that we hope we're getting? To answer those questions, you need to go a little bit further and you may need to go into this area that's called decision analysis, which is all about making high quality decisions under uncertainty in cases like this. So in 2009, we needed to do a cost justification for the overhead systems in our new hospital. The return on investment for the safe patient handling program for the overheads was not there when you just utilized the workers' compensation and lost and restricted days. One of the things that we had heard about was this value-driven approach at the School of Engineering at Stanford. The program taught us new methodologies to do cost justification on things that were hard to quantify which we knew that there were significant benefits associated with the program that we had not yet quantified, nor did we have historical data. We took the information, we took the classes, we developed a return on investment, and successfully moved our program forward for the overhead systems in our new hospital. Decision analysis works very simply by breaking a decision down into pieces. We have the alternatives, which are the different things that we could do. In the case of safe patient handling, do you go with portable or overhead equipment? Do you go into the care areas where 90% uh, or 100% of your patients require total or substantial assist, like the ICU? Or do you go downstream into some of the areas where maybe only 60 or 70% of your patients need that level of assist? Those are the kind of things that we think about for the alternatives. We need to think about the uncertainties and the risks, which are all the things that our program hopes to change. And then we need to think about preferences, which is how you value investments in your organization and what you do for a rate of return. We put all these pieces together in a quantitative model so that we can con conduct these thought experiments and explore what if we do this, what could the results be, how could we drive the value in our organization. Another reason that you need to go down this road is that even if um, you've gotten uh, predictions or data from vendors about what you could expect from uh, a typical safe patient handling program, 
The real data that we're interested in is the future data that will result when your program is actually implemented. That data doesn't yet exist. Now, in a data-driven world, it's a real challenge for people to think of moving beyond the data to thinking about uncertainty that you can't represent with data, which is why we need a decision analysis approach to thinking about uncertainty. Now, making this leap from thinking only in terms of data to thinking in terms of subjective judgments about future uncertainties like the results from your program is a huge challenge for risk managers and program managers in all organizations because you've seen it, I've seen it at so many meetings, where is the data? Now because we're interested really in the future data that doesn't exist yet, we need to supplement the data that we have with these subjective or Bayesian probability assessments. Now this next slide shows uh, what I sometimes call the spaghetti and meatballs diagram, or what all the risks and uncertainties were that we came up with for the Safe Patient Handling Program at Stanford. We thought about the things that people typically think about, like uh, workers' compensation costs that result from injuries to caregivers, uh, the lost and restricted days for staff who aren't able to be uh, at full duty because of an injury. But then we thought about other things that people don't typically include in their program, like the potential effect on turnover. So you may have seen the statistic that the physical demands of the nursing profession are the single biggest reason that people give for leaving the profession. And you may have also seen the data that it costs somewhere between sixty and eighty thousand dollars to recruit and train a new nurse. Well, guess what? If you put those together with a good quality subjective Bayesian estimate about how much you could reduce turnover, you can put a simple model together about what the value is from your safe patient handling program from reducing turnover. If this many fewer people leave, then that saves you the sixty to eighty thousand dollar recruiting and training costs for each person who doesn't actually leave. And that's the process we went through at Stanford, which is we went through all the potential sources of value and we thought about, well, what's the range of uncertainty in the effect that we could have on this from our safe patient handling program? In the case of turnover specifically, we thought, well, Stanford's a very desirable place to live and uh, my colleague Ed Hall has a statistic he's very fond of about the number of people who applied for jobs at Stanford Medical Center versus how many are actually hired to proudly conclude that it's actually harder to get a job at Stanford Medical Center than it is to get admitted to the university. So we said, well, maybe on the low side we have no impact on turnover at all. Maybe on the high side we could reduce it by as much as 20% not a huge impact, but we've taken a big conceptual uncertainty like the impact on turnover, we've quantified it in terms of a Bayesian uncertainty range between 0 and 20 percent, and from that we can calculate the uncertainty and what the impact on the total program is. Now when we've gone through and done this for all the things that we've been interested in, and it varies by institution, um, I'm finishing uh, another large project right now where they were actually very interested in the impact on hospital acquired pressure ulcers and patient falls, which was not a big factor at Stanford. So this is another reason that you may need a, an individual look for your institution because the things at your institution may be different than what was important at Stanford. But going through and looking at for each of these ranges of uncertainty, what if it was at the low end of the range, what if it was at the high end of the range, how much does that change the program value? Well that gives us a range that we can plot on a bar graph and if we plot all those from the biggest difference to the smallest difference, you get a diagram that looks like this one. The uh, characteristic shape is why it was called a tornado chart. I also like to call it a tornado chart because it shows what could blow you away. So in this case, the tornado chart for the program at Stanford showed that turnover was actually the biggest potential value driver for the program and you could actually almost double the value of the program by trying to drive the result that you get 
toward the higher end of the turnover reduction, and that changed the way that they thought about implementing the program. So they thought, well, gee, we need to include in our employee communications communication to our staff to let them know that we're putting these measures in place so that they can continue to do their job. And maybe also we need to think about in our employee satisfaction surveys asking questions to see if this is impacting our employee satisfaction, which I'm sure is a big thing at your institution as it is at Stanford. So by thinking about things in terms of these ranges of uncertainty, quantifying the impact, and then seeing which ones make the biggest difference, not only do you identify what the key value drivers are for your program, but you identify ways that you can get more value out of your program. And that's what we get out of the tornado chart. Now reality, of course, is that one thing is not varying at a time. Everything is varying all at the same time. Now when you have all these different things varying all at the same time, and because we've done probability assessments, we have probabilities of those, and if we look at all the different combinations, we start to generate an awful lot of scenarios. Thousands of scenarios, typically. Each one of them with a probability associated with that. And if you think back to the dark days of statistics, what does that sound like? That's a probability distribution. Now most people remember probability distributions as your bell curve, which is hard to read from um, when you're trying to get implications of that. So I like to show it in a form where you add up the area under the, prob under the probability density curve as you go from left to right, which again, digging back into the basement, that was integration, remember that? So if you integrate it, you get this kind of a curve, which is a cumulative probability distribution, and you can read some things off of it very simply. So we can see that in the worst case scenario, where we had the minimum program benefits and the maximum program costs, we still had about a $2 million program value. In the optimistic scenario, where you're getting more out of these ranges of uncertainty on the benefits, you have about a $10 million program value. And the mean of this whole thing is about $5 million. So in the prior work that they, did, they had done at Stanford, looking only at the stuff that people typically have data for, which is the workers' compensation costs and the lost and restricted days, they thought they had about a $2 million program. When we looked at all of the very real but hard to quantify sources of benefit, they had about a $5 million program. The outcome of the VDERM process allowed us to get cost justification for over $5 million in new equipment for the overheads, which will allow us 100% coverage in the new hospital. Now for another institution I worked with, the answer was you may or may not be able to pay for it from the workers' comp and the lost and restricted days because they already had a program in place and even getting better at that wasn't going to pay off very much but the payoff in the patient falls and the hospital acquired pressure ulcers was huge. So the elevator speech to the executives is, yes, we think we can track the data to pay for this based just on the workers' comp and on the um, lost and restricted days, but if you look at all these other things, we're talking about taking 4% out of the cost of care across the whole system. So those are the kind of simple answers that we get to that are really what the executives want to know, the short and pithy description of what you should do and why. But until we've gone through the process, we don't know what the two or three sentence answer is that will be right for your institution as opposed to what it was for other institutions. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, John. Um, so uh, we understand that we're at midday now. Um, we're going to keep going. Um, just to keep in mind, uh, if you do have questions about anything that's been raised today and in our discussion, please send those through via the comment box or via email for our Q&A session, which we'll hold momentarily. Um, I've just got the result from our last poll, which was at your organisation, what, what is or was the most significant driver for implementing the program? And an overwhelming majority of you, about 78%, ticked uh, the workers' compensation claims 
uh, box. Now, it was really interesting seeing on the screen there that workers' compensation didn't appear to be the most significant um, value driver for the program at Stanford. So, John, maybe you could explain how is this process different to the usual kind of business case that um, you know, we often see with people leading with the workers' compensa compensation cost um, savings? Sure. Well, the, the workers' compensation costs are certainly the cost category that's been most intensively studied. And uh, I've heard uh, Ed tell me the story about uh, him starting off going through the OSHA 300 logs to figure out the coding, which many institutions have to start with to even get a handle about, of all the injuries, which ones are actually caused by um, caregiver injuries handling patients. So it's certainly the most intensively studied area, and it's probably the easiest area to detect a signal, as I think of it. In other words, to say, this change in this category of injury, which we've coded, resulted from our safe patient handling program. But as we've seen in, in the work that we did at Stanford and the work that I've done for other organizations, there are other very real sources, but harder to quantify sources of benefit that give you an answer that would really sometimes take your program in a different direction. So although workers' compensation is what's been most intensively studied and what's easiest to track to validate your program value, to really get your arms around the total potential program value and to plan a program implementation that will realize all those sources of value, you need a more comprehensive approach that includes these very real but hard to quantify factors. And so, I mean, for, I think for probably a, quite a few folks, um, this approach would be fairly novel or not something they've seen before. Mm -hmm. um, is this sort of a normal way of going about things? Like what other organizations are using this kind of approach for um, demonstrating the, the value of the Safe Patient Handling Program? Well, that's a, that's a very interesting question, Simon. So uh, although use of this decision analysis methodology is fairly new in healthcare, it's actually been standard for decades in drug development and oil and gas exploration and in aerospace. So before Hoffman LaRoche develops a drug, before Chevron drills a hole, and before Boeing builds an aircraft, they use this methodology to look at their alternatives, to understand the costs and benefits of all those alternatives, and to quantify the total program cost and, and risk, and then at the end of that to produce a business case to support what they want to do. So new to healthcare, but it's been standard for decades in other industries where companies are making big, long-term, multi-billion dollar bets. Right, and so if it is kind of new in healthcare, Ed, when you were going about the process of selling this idea mm -hmm. um, to you know, your, your executives, you know, how did you go about selling it if you're using these you know, new diagrams and tornado charts and things like that? Yeah, I think um, what, what this actually does is it educates the person that's actually doing the delivery. So when nursing was um, delivering the presentation to our capital committee, um, what it allowed them to do is articulate in a clear and concise manner all of the value drivers associated with our particular program um, and then really touch on the things that the organization was really keen on trying to improve on. Mm -hmm. So as we go through it and we look at it, you may or may not actually go through and do final studies on these value drivers. Um, you may not spend time on it, but at the end of the day, you will have in your back pocket the elevator speech to say, this is the reason we need to move the program forward. And I know you as a senior leader really, um, really need this information, this data, and, and uh, so this is the information we're going to provide. And I think it, it just allows us a more concise um, elevator speech for our senior leadership. Yeah, I really liked what you said, John, about the short and pithy answer, but that's backed up by some s some really robust analysis. Mm -hmm. Awesome. It, it's the it's the one page summary with the fifty page appendix. <laughs> <laughs> right. Cool. Um, so let's go into our final little two minute segment. This is the last video that we're showing today, which is all about that final piece of how to track um, the success of your safe patient handling program, so that you can demonstrate its value over time. So let's go into that right now. Now the last part of getting the value out of your program is following up as you're implementing to look and see are you actually realizing the benefits that you predict out of this and that's a further use of the tornado chart because the tornado chart shows you for each of the categories of benefits 
where you should be tracking if your program is successful. So if a particular piece of data that you're tracking comes in outside of the range that you had in your tornado chart, you need to ask the question, what's going wrong and why that we're not getting the value out of the program? What they found at Stanford was that their baseline in workers' compensation costs was growing much more rapidly than they had predicted. So they had to take a look at that and find out why, and the answer was that a return to work program, which got injured people back to work in restricted duty faster, had actually been discontinued. So they needed to reinstate that program to fix a, something that was preventing them from getting the most value out of their program. So it not only provided uh, for Stanford a complete quantification of what the value of the program was, uh, an investment grade business case that sub could substantiate investment in it, it also provided a guide for tracking and validating the program value going forward. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, oh, this is a lot to take in in the course of a webinar. And uh, uh, there's no expectation that people need to become an expert in decision analysis to be able to make use of this methodology. Uh, the analogy I like to use is uh, accounting. So there's a lot of people who know how to read financial statements, but far fewer who know how to prepare them, and even fewer who know how to audit them to make sure that they're valid. The main thing we wanted to communicate today is that it's entirely possible to quantify what the total sources of value are in your safe patient handling program, to be able to display them in such a way that you can identify what the best program is for your organization and to justify the investment required to make it happen, and then afterwards to be able to track and validate that you're actually getting the value out of your program that you're hoping for. Awesome. So I think one of the big questions that comes up there is when you're looking at the, the various data points on that tornado diagram, how do we go about sort of collecting that data? And maybe Eric, you can address that? Absolutely. So uh, it all starts that interdisciplinary committee because to each driver of the program, there's something that's uh, important to that individual. And so if you just have one individual collecting all of that data, um, to a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So what we want to do is have um, hospital acquired pressure ulcers addressed. We want to have uh, HR for the nursing turnover rates um, coming together and everybody putting the data on the table. That said, just gathering the data doesn't mean that there's an analysis that's done. Mm -hmm. And so being able to lean on a uh, professional group or uh, other individuals in the organization to do that analysis is key. Um, as I've said, just gathering that data doesn't really mean anything. What you need to do is look at it from a programmatic outcomes perspective. And are there areas where, like you've seen, you know, um, like are there, are there key kind of blind spots um, for programs? Like, have you seen facilities run into the same problems over and over? Are there themes that you can point to? I think the themes are what we've talked about today, in that um, this is something where uh, it's a nursing program, yet it has a financial outcome. And so, what we need to do is create a program that's relatable to the nursing care staff, but also financially uh, impactful to the bottom line for the senior executives. Cool. Um, and what about for you, Ed? Like in terms of um, one of the things that you know you mentioned in terms of compliance, and we've had like. Uh, you know, one of the main things that came through that poll was that, you know, compliance is one of the big things that people are concerned about. Mm -hmm. So apart from having the interdisciplinary committee, are there other data points that you guys have tracked or how, how are you gathering that data at Stanford? Right. So, I mean, I think going through the data diagnostic process is key, um, especially on the outset and making sure that you educate everybody on what data points are being collected and why. And then um, when you start to receive that data through the process, I think it's imperative that um, you have a consistent approach and a consistent methodology for uh, tracking the information that's incoming. Um, and you, you may not have uh, systems currently set up to be able to track and trend the information um, that's out there, and you may want to set that up, especially if you see that it's a major value driver. Mm -hmm. um, and if particularly if it speaks to the organization or it speaks to the nursing staff, um, that's something you want to highlight so that they can get the feedback and get the information that they need um, in order to stimulate compliance within their groups. Awesome. Thanks. All right. So let's um, go into our Q&A session. We've had a few questions come in. 
Um, just as a reminder, um, you know, we still can take some questions. So uh, if you do have those, send those through. Um, minor housekeeping, um, after today's program, we're gonna have the pre-recorded videos up for you to view. Um, there's actually gonna be a class coming up on how to make the business case for safe patient handling um, that we presented by the Risk Authority, um, featuring some of the folks here. Um, so you can get some more information on that. And there's also actually a comprehensive white paper that you'll be able to download off of the website there as well. Um, so let's hop into this uh, Q&A session. And I've got a question here. Um, with all of the financial benefits that a safe patient handling program can provide, how do you make it relevant to the direct patient care staff? Um, why don't I give that to you, Susan? That sounds great. So I think the direct patient care staff members right now just are barraged with different types of change that happens at the bedside. So I think that's the first thing is to recognize that this is just one more change. Uh, there's almost this pattern of resistance toward change. So I, you know, I agree with what you said, Eric, about launching the safe patient handling culture or program on Nurses Week because it really is a gift for the nurses. And when we think about what Darla Watanabe said, that you know, the nurses just feel better if there is a responsible, meaningful, safe patient handling mm -hmm. program and culture in place. Uh, you know, anything that makes the caregiver's job easier, not just nurses, but all caregivers, makes their job easier for them on a day-to-day -day basis. But I do think the underlying commitment for uh, patient caregivers is really improving care for the patient. Mm -hmm. So I think if we can make that argument, it makes your job easier, it improves care for your patients for reasons that we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. And you may feel better. I mean, I don't want to get too anecdotal, but I talked with one nurse who had a strong, safe patient handling culture at her facility. And she said, I never could work more than three days a week, and now I can work four days a week. Mm. So that really did impact her on it, her and the facility on an economic level. I thought that was quite powerful. Yeah. So just to think about, you know, what motivates our caregivers and then to target the program in that direction. Awesome. Um, and I suppose, you know, one of the things we've spoken about a lot have been the, the interdisciplinary committee and the importance of having these key champions of the program. There's a question that's come in, how do I sustain a program once the program's in and committed managers leave the organization? Um, have you had that happen at all, Ed? Um, yes, I um, As a matter of fact, we've rolled, uh, or I participated in programs, uh, over 30 program rollouts. And um, typically, I, I call that the organizational meltdown. You know, once you have the key champion leave, um, the organization loses, uh, you know, key players that are moving the program forward, or there's administration that leaves that was totally supporting the program. So um, I, I think, you know, it goes back to taking a look at the business case, taking a look at the, the uh, entire project team and keeping them, and keeping that structure together, uh, and then trying to continue to move the program forward as a, you know, a sustained cultural shift within the organization um, is not something you can just give, off, give up on. Um, these programs are um, pretty complex. Um, we're creating a new cultural change within the organization. It's a different way of care for the nursing staff. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's one of these programs where we can't just put it on the shelf after a year. It takes um, continuation and uh, sus sustained um, uh, involvement from leadership and staff all the way through. Awesome. And the science changes over time. That's what I think is fascinating. It's a program that was uh, started 10 years ago. It was very different than a program today. And so a person may have a very, very sound program a decade ago, but the science has changed, and so the program will evolve as it follows the science. And, and I suppose also as the program kind of becomes part of the culture. Mm -hmm. um, what do you get other other sort of aspects of the care team involved in patient handling? Um, like, you know, we've spoken a little bit about this lift coach model. Like, how has that kind of been received? Do they view that as somehow because you've got these specialists? Do they kind of view that as sort of separate, or they view them as part of the care staff? How does that work, Eric? They need to be viewed as part of the care staff, and it's training through osmosis, so that just-in-time training, doing it at the bedside, is different than forcing somebody through a two-hour compliance training program. So when we're trying to just force this information into the uh, care staff's head over a two-hour period, we see that the retention rate is very low on those skills. However, if you're able to make it relatable at the bedside, working with the patients, working with the caregivers, and basically solving those complex uh, challenges that they're facing on a daily basis, 365 days a year, that's how it actually um, equates to a, a positive outcome for both the patients and the care staff. Awesome. Well, look, let's wrap it up a little bit, but I've got one final question for each of you. Um, if I'm a safe patient handling coordinator or someone who's been given the program, 
to own. Um, go, here it is, go do it. Um, maybe you could give us some words of wisdom or words of advice. What's, what's the one thing I, I, I need to know? Run the other way. Run the, <laughs> run the other way. <laughs> Short and sweet. So I, I would have to say, you know, make sure you put a, um, you know, that interdisciplinary team and a good project team together and then make sure that you engage senior leadership uh, in, in the project and let them know that it's not just a one-year thing. This is going to be a forever thing for the organization mm -hmm. and we're going to have to continue to move it forward. So keep that in mind as you, you know, start to engage in this process. Awesome. And I agree completely. I would say attach yourself to key initiatives. So find out what the key initiatives are in your facility and uh, don't run anything, <laughs> <laughs> anything worthwhile is time consuming. Yeah. Yeah. yeah awesome. And hard work. What about you, Eric? I would say that uh, to piggyback on to both Susan and Ed's comment, um, this, is a, this is a journey. You're going to hit stumbling blocks. Uh, don't get frustrated. Recognize that this is one of the more positive culture change programs you can implement. Uh, but recognize also it is bigger than you. The interdisciplinary committee um, really is your support infrastructure. If you're the champion leading that committee or you're a part of that committee, everybody needs to come together as a team and bring this program to the nursing and patient care staff. Nice. What about you, future? Uh, I would just uh, enlarge a little bit on what uh, my other speakers have said, which I think one way of summarizing all that is to say you need to have a solid understanding of what the benefits are, the total benefits of the program, and be constantly selling them to the different constituencies at the hospital to make sure that you maintain your support for this going forward so that your compliance rate stays up and you actually enjoy the kind of successes out of this program that are possible. Awesome. Well, look, thanks everyone for being here with us today um, on the panel and uh, for you in the office or at home. Um, a few minor things. Uh, on the website, you'll be able to view those pre-recorded videos um, at your leisure. Uh, there is a comprehensive white paper that gets into the nitty gritty of using the approach that John described for making the business case for safe patient handling. Uh, there'll be a class hosted by the risk authority on making the business case for safe patient handling. So you can, there's a form on there. You can put your information in there for further information. Um, otherwise, we want to thank um, our partner in crime on this project, um, the Association for Safe Patient Handling, um, who uh, were very kindly uh, spread the word, and our other supporters um, and partners, um, Aon, Hillrom, um, our colleagues at Stanford Hospital and Clinics, who uh, provided um, acting duties, uh, uh, acting services for our um, B-roll, and for our friends at Sherpa for putting all this uh, technology and wizardry together. Mm. So uh, thanks everyone, and uh, look forward for our next webcast, which will be all about um, the Pearl Program, early, uh, early communication and resolution programs um, at health facilities. So thanks very much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Mm.